next on the Eagle's Nest. You are at a place where the best benefit you'll get from ZimTrade is mentorship for now. I think already for me, I've identified a problem there. I'm a bit worried about your current capacity. I'm being led by the, the market to, to produce what I'm producing. I am looking forward to upscale my business. The reason why I'm not doing that is because I understand the market. The best thing I ever learned in business is that I'm not special. This season of the Eagle's Nest is proudly brought to you by ZimTrade and EcoBank, the Pan-African Bank, in partnership with UN Women. First in the nest tonight is Musa. My name is Musa Wenko Samoyo. I run a company called James Great Marketing Consultancy. I'm a marketing consultant by profession, studied marketing. It, it is a good platform for exposure um, for my business. Being a marketing consultant and all being, being surrounded by businesses, well, it's a no-brainer in that aspect. Musa is ready to take her business beyond the familiar terrain. My name is Mosawenko Simoyo. I'm from GM Squared Marketing Consultancy, and I'm a ma marketing consultant by profession. Um, marketing is the backbone of any successful business. It is what brings um, businesses closer to its customers. Without effective marketing, even the best products or services suffer uh, from failing to reach its target audience. It is all about understanding your target audience and crafting a message that will help you communicate your product and uh, service offering to them in a way that they would be able to understand, comprehend, and be happy with in order to buy from you or engage with your business. Um, we have been in business for the past uh, six months. Uh, I've been working in marketing as a consultant for the past three years. Uh, but as a business been running for the past six months, we have five employees. Um, we've got one office and we've got 32 happy clients at the moment. Problems that we aim to fix are the reasons why businesses fail in the first two years when they start running. 70% of all businesses fail in the first two years and 14% of that fell because of poor marketing. It's uh, another 14% of that fell because of customer service, poor customer service and customer retention management. Then 42% of that fell big due to poor planning, which is a lack of a marketing plan, a, work, a lack of a business plan, uh, and a sales plan. So we focus on helping businesses um, navigate through the MAC in terms of this and help them grow uh, beyond the the ceiling in terms of failure. Growth rates in the export market, at the moment have, we have four clients outside Zimbabwe that we've been working with. Um, and the market is a $78 billion uh, industry with a growth rate of 4.75% uh, expected uh, by the year 20, uh, 2028. And our goal as a company is to just get about 1% of that market share uh, which amounts to roughly $900 million. Um, our market niche uh, at the moment as a company is that we, we serve as a bridge between white-owned companies and the black market. So most of our clientele is white-owned companies that want to, to expand into the African market, black race market. The other niche of our business at the moment is that we also serve as a bridge between older generation and, um, and the younger generation. And we stand in that gap where we've got the best of both worlds, understanding Gen Z and understanding boomers as well. So that is at the moment our market niche. So from January uh, till March, we experienced an average turnover of $3,000 US dollars um, a month. And then uh, an average of 500 a month for strategies. Uh, our overheads were around 1,200. Our turnover in the second quarter was over slightly over 2,000. And our strategies, uh, as of now, uh, $600. So you get a lot of strategies in the beginning of the quarter the, in January and then mid-year when people are evaluating their businesses. So thank you for, for your time. In an interconnected world, 
and the business landscape becoming more seamless, Musa sees a prime opportunity for business expansion. Wisdom is first with the questions. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I can call you Musa. Yes, you, you may. Musa, um, what other platforms have you tried? Because there are platforms such as Upwork, Fiverr, etc., that offer you know, a platform for you to list for international clients. Have you tried any of those? No, we haven't. Okay. Uh, I've been working mostly on referrals. Uh, we do have some digital presence. The reason why I have not put a lot of work in my digital presence is because of the what is happening in the market. So I've done my market research. And mar the market is quite flooded with people parading as marketers, but not necessarily marketers. So... We want to build our name based on results first, then pushing our name without proper results and being falling into the trap of being covered to be one, purported as one of those people that claim to know what they do and they don't. But as a marketer, you can market yourself as a professional. Yes, I have been marketing myself as a professional, uh, proved on the records The My question is, considering your trade, um, how do you see yourself being able to consult a company about a marketing environment that you're not operating in? Uh, with marketing, it's most, mostly about research. It doesn't really necessarily that I need to be boots on the ground there because it's a global world at the moment and everything is mostly digital. And the biggest reason why companies come to me is because they're interested in the digital platform and how to upscale their digital platforms. The entrepreneur confidently defends her prospects diffusing concerns about decoding unfamiliar markets. However, Leslie harbors another concern. Oh, quite, quite interesting. Um, my only worry is, it seems your, your niche is, is racially oriented to say my biggest clients are white and they're trying to get into. Do you think that is really sustainable? Mm, uh, no, uh, they're not only racially uh, oriented. We've got two niches. One is that we bridge as a gap for Zimbabwean markets. Our Zimbabwean markets, yes, definitely. They are mostly white clients. But for outside Zimbabwe, you have got, we've got clients um, that just want either to understand the younger demographic better, how to talk to them, how to understand them, how to narrate their services to them in a way that they're happy and they can actually start buying from them. That's why I said our market niche comes in two points. Does your strategy work the other way around? Black companies that want to penetrate the white market? Yes. Um, my very first job, uh, uh, I was working in marketing for RCS in South Africa where I went to school. So uh, I, I initially, a uh, language barrier, I grew up, my dad is Ndevele, my mom is Shona. I didn't use uh, Shona and uh, Ndevele at home a lot. Um, so in South Africa, I had a difficult time speaking develop or communicating with people. So they moved me from a, from a black populated area in the company that I was working for to a white populated area. And I had great strides in working in that area because I could communicate easier with them. So from a background kind of instinct, yes, I, it, it works both ways because I understand what both markets want from just a general upgrade bringing kind of situation. So you don't have case studies of such? At the moment, no. Okay, it's just the other way around. It's just the other way around. Yeah. The judges are concerned that Musa's client portfolio does not reflect the diversity of the global market. George wants to closely examine the business model. You know, Musa, um, I once got into this sector and I still am. So I'm also a business growth consultant. I do a bit of what you're doing. And I think one of the greatest challenges you have is that um, people want to know what you've accomplished for them to use you. So if you approach any of these companies here, um, they already have a marketing department. And I want to understand, you said you've got 32 happy customers. Yes. Okay. So just to ask, what duration period? Because I know with consulting, it's for a specific period. Four months. So four months. Yes, is and they reevaluate based on results and, and, and what, recycle the contract. Do you mind sharing what you're charging 
in the four month period? Yes. Uh, so we've got a, a service fee, which is $200 uh, that they pay to, to, to us. And then everything else is structured for, for the specific service. So each client can pay anything roughly by uh, 1,000 to 1.5, depending on what they need at the moment. I'm just trying to understand how at the present moment, whilst you're still doing that, you would then be able to um, benefit in an immediate setting like what's happening right now from the training and mentorship of the program. If you are saying your business is not yet at a point where you are ready to put yourself out there like that on the social media. The reason why I'm not doing that is because I understand the market. And if I put myself out there on digital platforms, I fall into that very trip of being put in the same bracket of people who are not worthwhile uh, parading as marketers, as professional marketers, of which in this case, most of them are graphic designers uh, just trying to get a quick buck. This is within the Zimbabwean market. So, so my, my issue with your not uh, engaging in social media is somewhat counterproductive. If I go on your social media and you're in marketing and you, you've got a post from June uh, 2020, you know, it doesn't give me confidence. And that's the first thing that I would do. You know, that's the first thing that we do when people come here and they pitch. We go to their website, we go to their social media to see their timeline and their activity, right? To be perfectly honest, yes, I get it. It's, 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 there are a lot of people peddling a lot of things that they really can't actually offer. But that right? doesn't matter. Yes, but no, no, that, I'm that saying I matter. get it, I get it. But yeah. ultimately for a person who is saying that the idea is to be able to do export, you need those timelines. For the outside client who can't physically come or who, who isn't in your market, to actually have some sort of you know, yeah. information, a landing page of some form with information on it. But you guys, you are... You are pushing here. No, it's good to, to push her. To, to, to assume a position which she thinks doesn't work. On the, on, the, on the screen there, it says work with us, right? Are you working with any people locally or you have a specific people you want to work with? Quite a lot of companies on okay, locally. So we we present Metro Pitch as well. Okay, so let me tell you one thing. Um, one thing that will get business to you, I'm a true believer of what you said, that word of mouth, is the best form of advertising on this planet. Very true. But before word of mouth comes, I mean, just like we said, you need to see what you've done. We need to see the organizations you have physically gone in and there's a, a, there's a photo evidence, there's, there's some proof that you're working with these organizations. Your fear is going to limit you from getting more business. The hair model, George, mm. is used by one of the biggest architect that you actually know. Mm. He's not on social media, True. but he's the go-to person. Yeah. So but that's I'm, because he's been in the industry. In the for industry. But the and look, look, the name look, look, yeah. look at the clientele that she's also subscribing to. I, I'm going to say yes. Why? Because give and space, definitely I think she is up to something. Musa's strategy while under scrutiny, earns validation from Leslie. The question remains, will this resonate with the remaining judges? The best thing I ever learned in business is that I'm not special. I'm not unique. I'm not uh, irreplaceable, right? Yes. The honest truth is that there are people who do what you do. Mm -hmm. Right? A lot of them. That will say what you say. That will get paid. And you're leaving a lot of money on the table. Do the work now. Set the foundation. Have a wide base so that ultimately you can choose who you want to work with. Guys, it's like you're saying if she's not on social no, media no, and no, they're no, present. No, that's not what you're saying. She's I not think, doing the okay, work. Okay, I'm going to give my vote on this. I understand the methodology you're trying to use in terms of working around referrals and letting word of mouth be your target, great. What I'm not up for in this particular frame right now, given what Eagle's Nest is aiming for, is that I think in terms of the export side of things of your business, you need to come with a pitch that speaks towards what it is you're trying to achieve with the export front. So for me, 
I would say to you, go back, re-strategize, remodel your presentation towards being export oriented in a manner that we would be able to understand it doesn't take this much deliberation. So for me, it's a no right now, but I'd love to see what you can come together with um, for the following season. Right, uh, Musa. Yes. Six months is 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 a is a very short time. You spoke about businesses failing, in you know the first two years, very large percentage. Okay. I want you to go through the two years. I can guarantee you, you're going to come back with a different perspective. Guaranteed. Okay. I wish you all the best. It's a no from me. Thank you. I think you've gotten a lot of input, and uh, I promise you, if you don't use social media as a voice, you're not going to be in business in the next six months to a year from now. With the five employees you have, and this uh, word of mouth referral, you're not going to get a lot of business coming in. And sooner than later, your expenses are going to be higher than what you're getting in. So for me, it's a no. I really want you to go and work on what we have said. Um, you've got a client. Yeah. Um, um, I'm definitely. the first black business yes. that wants to get into the other side. <laughs> Please. The first black business yes, that's that wants to then transit into the white COVID. Don't take this as us shooting you down. These are perspectives from us that ultimately are to help you to go forth. So it's great you came, but go back with the intel we have and go and apply or not apply what we've said. And we wish you the best in the future. Thank you very much. Sure then. Thank you, Musa. All right. Musa walks out of the nest with one yes. The outcome, though marked by one endorsement, reflects the essence of the entrepreneurial journey. Social media is overrated, guys. Tell me, tell me as glide time, why do you use social media? Why don't you think that your product can, people can just pick up your cereals, your this, your that? Without social media. I first saw your brand because, on social media. Because I, I also first saw your brand on social media. On social media. And, and how many sales have you given me? It doesn't matter. Oh, my brother. <laughs> I, I think, no, it doesn't matter. I, I think you, you, that's, that's why the why, No, why, why, I'm saying it doesn't matter. Why do great companies advertise on social media? It's overrated, I, my thinking. I think the hair model, she has a network. It's like the, that uh, it's localized, work suit guys. But that, it's that work suit guy, he doesn't even have a... Lazy. But he has got an ecosystem. He's, he's nailing it. Personally, I had no problem with her not being on social no, media. Well, how, no problem how, how many of your businesses on are on social this media? This is what I'm saying, that I had no problem with her not being on social media. Uh, Where my issue comes is that you don't want to be on social media, but you're trying to reach a broader audience. She mm -hmm. is a white girl in black skin. She has got the audience. <laughs> That's what you guys have to understand. Next is Gertrude, who is ready to bring African culinary heritage to global taste buds. African greetings from Majestic Africa. My name is Gertrude Chambati. I am into value addition of small grains and health related products. Uh, the whole idea is to provide quality traditional food stuff due to the reason that the world is health conscious because of uprising of non-communicable diseases. So I decided to take part in providing quality traditional food stuff for the health living. My, my target market is upper to medium uh, in terms of economy. Uh, and I am penetrating to export market. I managed to supply to individuals who are in diaspora in three countries. That is United Kingdom, America, and Canada. I am looking forward to upscale my business. Thank you. As global interest in diverse, Nutritious food rises. The African traditional foods industry gains momentum. Gertrude has ambitions to expand her business beyond borders. And she seems to have made an impression on Nombola. Gertrude, for starters, I want to say well done for putting your contact details clearly on your packaging. 
and um, also the health benefits that you've put in. I think so far those are the key things that I've, I've picked up on. Thank and your you. packaging at least seems durable enough for transportation. So, Thank you. well done to you. It's a very good, yeah, it's looking good for now. Hi Gertrude, how are you? Um, when did you start this business? I started the business in the year 2020. Okay. Can you tell me your, your sales for the year so far? It's about uh, close to 2,000 or 2,500. I managed to have a net profit of $234. All right. And um, where is your major market? Is your market here locally in Zimbabwe? Or you're mainly just an export business? Currently, my main market is in Zimbabwe, but I'm looking forward to export at the same time supplying in Zimbabwe. Could you maybe just give us a brief rundown of the type of products that you're producing? Uh, in small grains, I have finger millet, I have prime millet, I have brown rice, I have sorghum, I have wheat, I have also indigenous fruits, that is tamarind, um, like baobab bao powder. Uh, when it comes to vegetables, I dried vegetables. I focus on mutsine, munyeve, and munyemba. And I do also uh, dried maize that we know as mitakura. I have round dinners and I have um, the cowpeas. Okay, those are a lot of products that you've mentioned. Do you actually know the total number of lines that you're producing? Yes, I have uh, about uh, 18 range of products. 18. But yes, okay. but for export marketing, I'm focusing mainly on small grains. I'm seeing that uh, the clients focus mainly on taking small grains. Okay, what are your pricing points on these products? Just give me maybe three lines where you give me your retailing price and your cost of production. For finger millet, for example, I can buy a bucket of finger millet at a uh, range of 16 to 18 dollars, depending on season also. After I buy that bucket of finger millet, in total quality to of a millimeter that I can get from that bucket is about 13 to 14 kgs. If a bucket is giving you 13 kgs and your packaging is 1 kgs, when you factor in all your other expenses, what's your profit margin per bucket? Uh, approximately $5 to $6 a, pack, a bucket. My, my profit after any other expenses. Okay. I think already for me, I've identified a problem there. Because at a $5 profit margin per bucket, for the amount of work you're going to have to do, it doesn't give you a very sustainable business model. Um, either you're going to have to find ways to scale it for it to actually become a lot more financially viable for you, number one. Or you're going to have to rebrand and put yourself in a position where you're seen as a premium supplier of these goods. The entrepreneur discloses low margins in the line of products earmarked for export. Now, Wisdom is ready to explore the Majestic Africa's line of products. Your standard package size is 1 kg. I have 1 kg packaging, 2 kg packaging, 5 kg packaging. Okay, and how many units have you, did you sell last month? Uh, in terms of units, I'm not sure, but I managed to sell $700 in sales. $700? I'm, I'm noticing that you, your, your financials are estimates, you know, numbers that are not specific. What's the reason for this? Are you not really tracking your progress? Uh, I'm tracking, but uh, I'm not sure, like, uh, every product in the head. Tracking is very important because it allows you to know your most profitable product and where to put your, most of your effort. Wisdom is displeased with the lack of financial precision as Gertrude's numbers remain shrouded in estimates. Leslie steps in to share his insights. I have a lot to say to you. Okay. Yeah, first of all, as I'm looking at this, there is quite some work that needs to be done. But I'm happy you started and I'm happy there's this drive that you're trying to push, which is... I don't still remember the last time I ate white salsa myself. I'm also now doing the munga shiyo and things like that. Yeah, there's that drive of health consciousness. So it's a, it's a market that is also growing, you know, because of the NCDs. I'm a bit worried about your current capacity because 700 with what you have just told us, um, it's, it's a bit on the lower side, right? 
I think there is still a lot that can be done in terms of, you know, upscaling the capacity. Because once, like what Nomvula was saying, to say when your level of operation is very low, it takes a lot of resources, labor hours, you know, you need a bit of mechanization so that the process does not cost you too much. Um, and also, uh, in terms of, uh, as I was looking at the brown rice, I've also seen that you also now need to put in quality control systems because as I'm seeing it, I'm seeing some foreign particles around the brown rice, you know, uh, which is something that cannot be too acceptable in the, for, in the foreign market. Uh, I see there's this declaration organic. You need to be certified to be organic. So are you rather move from that wedding of organic to natural, you know, because organic certification requires a certain level of, you know, compliance and a certain level of, you know, certification from different bodies, organic certifying bodies. So then this claim should not also be there. On the name now, uh, Majestic Africa. Africa is very broad. It's one of the most diversified continent in the world, you know, in, in just in Zimbabwe, there are a lot of tribes, you know, with different, you know, uh, cultures. You go to Zambia, the same thing, you know. So at the end of the day, this is not a true depiction of what Africa is all about. This is a depiction of maybe a tribe, a certain tribe in Zimbabwe, whether it's Kalanga, Shona, Ndebele, or whatever. So what you then need to do is to then localize your name to where you get most of your raw materials, you know, and then you bring the majesty around that, especially in terms of storytelling and, you know, how you're impacting the community and, you know, that kind of a thing. It then also helps you to leverage around where you're taking the raw materials and write a good story. But if you then say majestic Africa, there is now need for you to have that common denominator and it's difficult for you to do that at this, end, at this stage. So these are some of the considerations. I will not speak about date of manufacture, which I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing, I'm not talking about traceability issues. I will not talk about date of expiry. I will not talk about those issues. Just focus on the things that I've told you now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think currently with where we're at, you are at a place where the best benefit you'll get from ZimTrade is mentorship for now. Because I believe you're at a very startup stage where you need to you know focus on the amazing insight you've gotten from the judges and you know you apply that and then you go a step at a time as you grow and ultimately to prepare you for export quality so for today um, i'm going to give you a no because i think you're not yet ready for export yet there's a lot of work to be done so for me it's a no but well done to what you're doing Please keep on keeping on. A no doesn't mean that you have failed. Please get that correctly. For you to even come on to this show is a great accomplishment. And what you are living with here is insight, is knowledge, is things that you are never going to apply by yourself. So go back and work on that. And in a later day, apply again to come through. And I can tell you, this is a good product and you can actually you know, go places with the insight that you've been given. Thank you. On this package, you know, I'd want to see uh, cooking instructions, service, serving suggestions. I mean, if you're going to export a product like this to someone who has never seen it, they don't know how to actually use it, you know. And um, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done on uh, the branding, uh, the communication, and uh, also your, your distribution. So for now, there's a lot of foundational stuff that you still need to do. It's going to be a no from me. Thank you. Many participants have come onto Eagle's Nest um, where they've reached proof of concept stage and they've returned to Eagle's Nest for a second time round and have progressed really, really well. I really do hope to see you coming back to the next season of Eagle's Nest, but it will be a no from me today as well. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think I've, I've said enough. Just go and do what I, I, I've advised you to do. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Gertrude.
And thank you so much. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Gertrude. Despite the setback of a collective no, the entrepreneur leaves the eagle's nest with a wealth of invaluable knowledge. We look forward to seeing Gertrude's return to the nest, having translated these insights into actionable strategies. Next is an entrepreneur ready to present his products, which he believes are buzzworthy. Hello, judges. Hello, how Hello. are you? Hi. Yeah. So my name is Emmanuel, Emmanuel Chirove. I'm coming from Eleanor Private Limited and we are into honey production and processing. So I came with my samples. We have two variants. We have the pressed honey, and we also have the raw, raw honey and processed. So that's my product. Its brand name is Mr. Hundred Percent. So I produce thirty-five bottles per day. I process one bucket per per day, one bucket of honey, twenty liters. So it gives me 35 bottles, 600 grams. That's my capacity. So it's 35 bottles per day. And if we multiply it by five, excluding weekends, per week I produce around 175 bottles of 600 grams honey. I think I, I'm done for, for now. The local honey industry reflects biodiversity and plays a vital role in economic growth and community livelihoods. Emmanuel is confident that his product can make a buzz in global markets. Nomvula is first to dip into the nectar of the matter. I'm curious to know, are you actually doing the beekeeping yourself or are you buying from other people? I'm taking this hand for, from Chimanman and the, that's where I, I grew up and I have, I have learned there, so I'm planning to do beekeeping for, for myself. Okay, you're saying all the way money, money, how is that affecting your cost of production? The transport costs are, are high, but are, they're, they're not really high. I'm using the, the, the bus to, to, to take my hand from Chimanman to, to, to And what Arad. happens when you need to scale? Yeah, when I need to scale, I will consider going with a truck there because when when the volumes are high when i get more honey it becomes cheaper to to transport it even using my my own transport but for now i'm using the the bus all right and then you process it here in harare you press it yes here in I, yeah i press it here okay hi emmanuel how are you i'm good thanks Tell me about your distribution channel. You're telling us you're selling a couple of bottles. Where are you selling these? I'm selling it to, to individuals, to, to households for now. And recently I, uh, I started supplying a, a shop in the Eastgate market. I'm giving them some bottles and they are selling the hand for me. Okay. Tell me, um, when you look at your honey compared to every other honey you see in the market. Are you happy with your packaging? Yeah, I'm happy, but I've not reached the, the, the level that I, I would like to, to, to reach. Okay. So I see like your, the, the labels are not, um, you know, properly stuck on. Yes. Yeah, well, what is the challenge with that? Yeah, the challenge was on the size of the, of the label. So it, it, the, the width should be smaller so that it, it can fit well on the bottle. So it was on the size of the label. Did you just do this for this show or this is what you usually supply your honey as? This was not the, 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 the original label. I just uh, added some information. There was less information on my other label that I had. So you were not using this label for the products that you've been supplying um, in the market? Yes, I was using a, a smaller label. Oh, okay, got yeah. you. 
is a sticky situation for the entrepreneur. The judges seem unimpressed with the export-bound product packaging. Wisdom wants to cut straight to the chase. Why do you want to export? What's your reason for wanting to export? Okay, I want to export because uh, I think the, this product is a potential organic product. I can't say it's organic for now because it, it has not been, been tested. So, and organic products are appreciated more in, in Europe or in other countries than in, in Zimbabwe. So that's why, that's one of the reasons I want to export my Is there a country in particular that you have uh, done the research and looked at the price of organic honey? Uh, for now, no. I only know of New Zealand, of Manuka honey, where the prices are very high. Okay. Uh, who does your quality control? Uh, it's, it's me. <laughs> okay. When we are exporting products, you know, they have to be 100%, Mr. 100%, right? The entrepreneur's export aspirations hit a reality check, revealing a steep learning curve ahead. Leslie, seasoned in the sector, steps forward to share a wealth of insights which part of money man? Uh, Machongwe. Mm. Ah, okay. I know it very well. Yeah. Your capacity is very low. Yeah. With the honey that comes from your area, mm -hmm. you should have been doing more. I think me and you know that. Yeah. You know, the people can actually get stuck with honey in each money man. Uh, and there's a lot that you should do. Why? Because you come from that area. Yeah. So it's a responsibility that you, you have for your people. So just 35 bottles is not enough. Yeah. Based on the capability of the area, you know, uh, I, I actually know that terrain very well. And even the tonnage that comes from that area can actually be in excess of maybe, uh, maybe 50 to 100 tons of yeah. honey that comes from that area. I'm being led by the, the market to, to produce what I'm producing. I actually, from your area, I actually take about maybe five to six tons a month just from your area. Yeah. You know, so there's a lot that you need to do so that at least you can ramp up. It's to your advantage and to the advantage of your community. You also need to um, use maybe a semi-gloss label, okay. which doesn't go out. You see, this one is now fading out. You know, as you wipe it, honey is sticky. It sometimes it spills when you are mm -hmm. trying to pick it. Yeah. As you wipe it, the label is going out. So try to use a semi-gloss vinyl. Uh, not just a vinyl, but okay. a semi-gloss which has got that, you know, covering. And with the number of, um, you know, bottles that you do, mm -hmm. I think the hand application should actually be better. Because mm -hmm. your pricing is a bit on the premium side, right? So at least your presentation should also suggest that, you know, this is real honey. I like the disclaimer that you have put here, that pure honey crystallizes in cold conditions. Many people don't know it. Mm -hmm. Actually, when people see honey that has crystallized, they think, ah, you know, maga is for sugar, that kind of a thing. So this is also very good that you have done. Thank you. To actually put the disclaimer. And also putting that the area where you take the honey is eucalyptus because eucalyptus quickly crystallizes. And that's why your honey is this white because it's eucalyptus or that pese pese tree that the bees are feeding on. So at the end of the day, there's also need for you to substantiate whatever claims Mr. 100%. This is more sentimental than it is realistic mm. because it's only you and the farmer who know that this is 100%. So you need to take this to the laboratory. It won't cost you much. Okay. Uh, SAS, they can do your analysis, you know, moisture content and things like that, so that you have a certificate of analysis for the hand. Okay. Not just that, you also need to go to the veterinary services for you to then get that certificate of the toxicology level, because okay. ultimately bees pick up from different plants and things like that. And then canary tobacco farming areas 
they also pick up those pesticides and they can be found and which can be a bit dangerous to the consumer. So you also need that analysis to be done on the hand. Also, I think you need to change your model. You know, uh, when you are resident where the raw material is found, you have got more leverage on the price and on the cost. Mm. But also the safety of taking a product 400 kilometers without even the due care that happens to the product is also not very safe for consumers. So you are better off having a small plant, your rentals will go down, and even the sun that comes from there, it can help you in terms of your extraction. Your sun extraction is better, you know, you don't need electricity for that. I think there's a lot of work that you need to do to really get this out there. And even raw honey, you don't need to pick it this way. Use those panets, you know, it will look better, it will look more presentable. You don't then break the combs, you know, because by forcing the combs in there, mm -hmm. you're also breaking the combs, which also distorts the presentability of the product. Mm -hmm. The best for you is just to take everything that we have said to you and also maybe have outside discussions so that at least you can grow your business. Um, and honey, honey is very difficult to export without all these things happening because animal products, especially Europe, mm. animal products are difficult. I actually use honey for one of my granola, but when I wanted to take it to a laboratory, mm. DHL said, no, we can't take honey because it's not allowed to take anything with, because it's animal product. Mm. Europe, all oh, they prefer plant-based products. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done for this thing to be exportable. Okay. So I think there's a lot of help that you can gain from myself and the other uh, panelists. But for now, for us to push you to say, no, go forward, your capacity is low and there's a lot that needs to be done on the ground. So for me, I think we can help you. The mentorship can help you, you know, really work around the product, the business model and things like that, which is to your advantage, but then to push you forward where we know very well that you are not going to, to make it. Okay, thank you. Um, Emmanuel, I think you've heard a lot and uh, everything else you've been told is important to incorporate it. And I'm sure, you know, when you do come back, you'll be at a far better place with all this input that you've gotten. And I like what you're doing. first to your product before you get into the stores and then ultimately you're distributing all over. Thank you. Okay, I think you've been given quite a bit of a complimentary tutorial in terms of the changes that you need to do on your product. Look at this more from an angle of recommendations than it is judging that your business is not where it needs to be. Thank and, you, Emmanuel. And well done on the leads, they are not leaking. So I okay. think that's a plus, yeah. But let's, okay. let's do the rest. Thank you. Okay, okay. Emmanuel. Okay. While recognizing the potential, the judges deem Emmanuel's venture as early stage and in need of more nurturing before regional expansion. They believe the insights gained within the nest are the best immediate support for his journey. I think there's a lot of intellectual property that is transferred. There's a lot of, you know, refinement of ideas. There's a lot of support that comes. There's a lot of interrogation, not to, you know, undermine anyone, but also to share the experiences that the, our, 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 our team has, you know, that diversity, some are in marketing, branding, some are in service, some are in agriculture, um, and I'm in manufacturing. So that diversity that is being brought by the judges on the table is something that young people should actually come. I think if young people come to learn with an open mind, you know, I think there is a lot to, to really take from this show. Yeah, I'd like to encourage uh, more participants to apply to the program. Uh, you gain some invaluable, you know, lessons, nuggets, advice, insight from industry specialists. I've also seen a lot of uh, contestants uh, starting to collaborate with other uh, contestants to uh, come up with even better products. So it's an all-round beneficial program for those who dare to enter.